Welcome, everyone. We have uh, the privilege of being joined by John Railing today. John is widely considered one of the top close-up magicians in the U.S. He performs regularly for celebrities, entertainers, leading corporate executives, and he has performed for U.S. presidents, foreign dignitaries, and heads of state from around the world. With his many interests and a varied background, John is also a bibliophile with one of the one of the largest collections of movable slash pop-up books in the world. So on that theme, today John is going to share The Magic of Movable Books, a history of pop-up books and paper engineering. So take it away, John. Thanks, Scott. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone to the Celebration of Mine on pop-ups. I'd like to, um, first of all, say that I've uh, been attending uh, the Gathering for Gardeners since the third one, so it goes back 20 years or more. And uh, after Martin Gardner passed away and uh, Celebration Mine became an event uh, every year. Uh, each year I participated, either my uh, kids have hosted the Celebration Mine at their high school, or we put uh, some parties together to share um, Martin's passion. And Martin, Gardner really had a passion for magic, among all other things, but also great things involving uh, geometric figures and math and um, paper magic and pop-ups fall into that category. One of the first questions I get is, when was the first pop-up or when did pop-ups first get started? And I always qualify that by saying, well, pop-ups slash movable books because movables came before true pop-ups. And the first movables truly was in the 1200s, 1300s, uh, but they weren't printed books. And my focus today is talking about the printed books as well as the books that are not considered artist books, you know, mass produced books. And uh, the primary focus is going to be talking about the paper engineers and their thought processes and some of the developments of getting some ideas off the ground. But I would like to start with a brief history of pop-ups and movable books. The first printed movable books was in the middle 1500s. And here is one of the PAs, one of the greatest books this is a facsimile of probably one of the rarest and most important pop-up books. It's some astronomy books, and those from the mid-1500s were called bovelles. Bovel is a French word for wheels, and this pop-up, I should say this movable, is all, can you, um, huge lithographs, but these are wheels that twist. In each spread, there's um, several dozen spreads in here, plots the movement of the planets. And some of them have inner circles. And this one is uh, for Saturn. And here's one for Mars. And let me talk a little bit about this. This is a book on the Library of Congress and one of their books in the collection. So you can see how gentlemen at the Library of Congress is moving this around. The book I just showed you, this one here, was published in 1967. It's a facsimile published out of Zurich. And unfortunately, most of the wheels when this was assembled was bungled. There was only 750 of these copies made of which this is one of the limited 200 copies. And so when all the wheels were bundled, you couldn't use it. And Professor Owen Gingrich from um, Harvard and the Smithsonian is the world's authority on Bovells. And I sent this book to Professor Gingrich to see if he could correct the wheels, correct the Bovells. Then I approached the Adler Planetarium to see how we could use the wheels to plot the movement of Mars. That whole process 
deserves a whole nother hour conversation. After the movables from the 1500s, the first true pop-up, and Scott, if you wouldn't mind, the first true pop-up would have been the one in the first Billingsley, the first Euclid Elements English language edition, which is called the Billingsley copy or the Billingsley translation. Uh, Billingsley translated all 13 books of Euclid. And in the back of it, one of the, you have these flaps that can be lifted to make the tetrahedrons and the geometric solids. This was done in 1570. So I would say the first true pop-up book is this one here of Euclid's Elements. Most uh, pop-ups that we think of today is involving children's books, but the children books really didn't begin until the late 1700s and certainly in the mid 1800s, partly because in the late Victorian age, the children finally were allowed out of the back room and more divertisements or toys or uh, other recreational items were being made for children. And that happened with books. And in the 1880s, 1890s, was what's considered the golden age of pop-ups, mainly because of two producers in, of books. And one was called Ernest Nister, an Englishman, but he published, he produced his books out of Germany. I want to get a book here. And Ernest Nister had these wonderful chromolithographs. That was another reason why uh, children's books became important. And here's the pop-up element. And you can see the die cutting is really precise along the edge here. Even the little tail there. The other big name in the uh, late in the golden age was a gentleman by name of Lothar Megendorfer. And Megendorfer, we keep getting out of the screen to show you, had these so uh, puppets characters. And again, this is a copy. And most of his pull tabs were from the bottom. And if you could, and the reason I brought this copy out is because here is the pool table. And he had several movements. In this case, there's a foot, a hand, a shoe, all moving. And in the back of it, you will see this is how it looks exposed with these several elements. When I mentioned the amuse, amusements from the late 1800s, this is not a pop-up or a movable, but it's considered one of the great pièce de résistance of children's books of that era. And this is the German, the original edition. It's called the Sprechen Sie Bilder book or the talking or speaking picture book. And what is great about this book is that there's each spread, and then you, here, let me move this, you have an arrow, and an arrow goes to a pool, and it gives you the sound of the animal. And this is after 150 years. I'll look at another arrow. Listen to this. A small cuckoo and and finally and the last spread of this book has mama and papa which may be the first time anyone tried to use 
human language in a book. I mentioned the Megendorfer. This may be one of the best Megendorfers. Maybe we can uh, spread this out. So this spread opens up each one all the way down. And I want to move forward quickly because the to give you the history of pop-ups in a nutshell. After the golden age in the 1800s, early 1900s, most pop-ups and movables stopped, especially during the First World War. And then it was revitalized again in the 1930s by a firm called Blue Ribbon Press. And this would be the first book that Blue Ribbon did. It's also the very first book with pop-up in a title. And so each of the Blue Ribbon Press books had three spreads. And they were very popular. Besides the Disney characters, I think Disney started in 1927, so this would have been in the first five years of Disney. Uh, they also created two what they call Waddle books, where you put the characters together, and there was an incline road, and they waddled down the incline. There was a Wizard of Oz Waddle book, as well as a Disney Waddle book. And most of the other Blue Ribbon Press books were the comic books of the characters of the era, uh, Dick Tracy, and um, uh, I'll pick out a little one here. Here's a small one, Buck Rogers. Can you see this? And here it is. Again, this is about 1935 for this one. After the 1930s, uh, Nothing really extraordinary took place except um, until um, you had some pockets of pop-ups. The Bucano, the Bucano series in the, in the early 40s, I brought this one out. This has several, several pop-ups. But there's one in particular I wanted to share. Let's see, here it is. This one here, the pop-up house, because for those who know, this is an example of Pepper's Ghost. The Pepper's Ghost uh, shows a fairy floating in the air in the book. Pepper's Ghost was a, a magic uh, apparatus that was used or a, a technique that was used in theater to uh, create some of the first illusions on stage. There was also a series of books in the 1940s by Julian Ware. And then in the early 60s, some pop-ups were coming out of Czechoslovakia by a gentleman by the name of Kubasta. And here we go. You can imagine in the war, behind the Warsaw Pact, you had these marvelous big pop-ups. And I mentioned Kubasta because that was the inspiration for the renaissance of pop-ups in the 1960s. It all started with a handful of gentlemen uh, around 1965. And they were inspired by the Kubasta pop-ups. I'll bring another one out. You see this? Christopher Columbus. And there was a gentleman by the name of Waldo, Waldo Hunt, or Wally Hunt, who was in the advertising world. And Wally had the great idea of using pop ups in advertising. And he turned to a colleague of his, a Danish gentleman named Ib Hennick, I-B is his first name, Hennick, P-E-N-I-C-K, and Ib was the genius behind the paper engineering and the renaissance of paper engineering. And Ib was inspired by the Kubasta books 
and told Wally, I could do that. And I'd like to show a couple images here. This would be a great picture right here. Can you see it? There's Mr. Pennick, Ib Pennick. Ib died about 1998. And it was Ib who figured out how to do pop-ups. Like I said, it was first done in advertising, and one of the Ibs' first, first uh, jobs was the IBM Selectric Typewriter. In those days, IBM, the Selectric Typewriter was really cutting edge with that little ball that moved up and turned, and the sales force did not have actual prototypes to carry around. So they asked Ib what he could come up with, and here's the portfolio that the salesman carried, and when they opened it up, it became this. Oops, upside down. So the before and the after. And the salesman would have their own sheet of paper in the uh, pop-up, full-size, selectric typewriter. And then they could choose the color they wanted from a color wheel at the bottom. Also during this era, Ib and Wally did the pop-up map of the World's Fair. And then the first pop-up book they did was with uh, Bennett Cerf's pop-up riddles. This would be 1965. Bennett Cerf had nothing to do with the pop-up riddles. Wally and his team in the office made up their own riddles. Bennett was too uh, busy running Random House and also appearing on What's My Line. I bring out this book because the last riddle is how do you divide 16 apples among 17 people? And you pull the tab and it says make applesauce. Now, here's why I show this. All the characters in here are the people who worked with Wally. That's Wally Hunt. There's Ib Pennick over here. And another gentleman I'll talk about here with the goatee is John Stregen, the Asian or Japanese character, Shakira Hara. He was the illustrator. And it was interesting because Wally did not want all the names of the participants in the books. And Wally, because everyone wanted their name in the book, and if you saw it would have been looking like a movie production with 20 or 30 names on it. But he did get their character in there. Like I said, Bennett Cerf wasn't personally involved, even though uh, Wally's company did about 50 books for Random House. Also at the same time, they did about 40 books, 40 titles for Hallmark Cards. The, but Bennett Cerf's son, Chris Cerf, was also interested in this and was at Random House and came across in, in, 19, in 1968, was responsible for the Andy Warhol pop-up called the Andy Warhol Index Book. And I will turn to a well-known, there was a, a, a record production in here, a balloon that you could blow up. But the iconic image is the tomato can. And the other book of interest in that time was this one here called Pornographics, where they had the great idea of taking great paintings and covering them up to make them politically correct. So here's all the great art of the, of the, um, that needed some cover up. Here's the birth of Venus. 
Here's the Venus de Milo. And of course, Da Vinci's covering himself up. I mentioned earlier that they, Wally didn't want their names on the book, but Ib was responsible for this book and he did get his name in there as the person taking the photograph. Although he was actually responsible for the entire book. Describing uh, movable books or pop-ups, uh, it was an interesting scenario where a librarian from Yale cataloged what they called eccentric books. And eccentric books is any books, and here's the Appianus there, the Astronomy of Ravel. Any eccentric books or any books that did something other than what you'd expect. So that would be slant books, uh, scratch and smell, uh, a whole world. Of, but the world of pop-ups and movables was the key of the eccentric books. But the focus of Ib and his team were the series of books for Random House. So you had the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you had the Electric Company, and all these books, as well as the Hallmark books, all were of uniform size. And it seemed like every book they produced were all the same size, and the reason for that was that the quantity of paper that went into these books with six to eight spreads, they tried to keep on one sheet. Because what Wally discovered was that the economics of producing a pop-up book was critical, that you had to reduce as much as you could with the number of glue points and the number of folds and keep the book on one sheet that would go through the printing press before it's die cut. Uh, Ib told me that one of his greatest challenges was he didn't have a large budget for, for, to do the pop-ups in these uh, books. And I asked him what his favorite book was, and he told me it was the Muppet Show book like this. And I asked him why, and he said because he had more, it was the first time they gave him a budget that he could do something more than those other books. And this is one of the books he did, The Statue of Liberty, which you can see here. And this is what a mock-up pre-production would look like. So this is Ib's mock-up of that book. My discovery or interest in pop-ups began because I was an Edward Gorey collector, and this is an Edward Gorey pop-up, which Ib was the paper engineer. Those who know Edward Gorey's work will appreciate this. Ib told me when he first met Edward Gorey to do the, uh, the book, Gory in the editor's office at Random House, Gory would sit next to him, but wouldn't talk directly with him. He would only talk through the editor. Until such time that Gory realized what a genius it was, and they got along extremely well after that. At the initial meeting, he would never talk directly with him. Another book related to pop-ups is called the Tunnel Books. And the first Tunnel Book would be for the 1851 London World's Fair. And you would look through, this is what I call the accordion book, and you would look through the opening and the beginning and see all the scenes. I mention that because Gory did one. And you would look through the hole at all the seams. And we had, Ib and I had the great idea of using the same thing as a, as a package for a DVD. 
or CD in those days. The CD had an eyeball. Can you see that? And then we would extend this. So this was the CD. Also, Ib worked on Graceland as a promotional item. And many of these promotional items come because someone say, we need something to um, for a specific purpose. I was asked one time by um, the founder of Vail Ski Resort, I would like a mountain of in a pop-up. And so I got the topological map of the Vale Valley and we did the honeycomb effect and produced the ski resort. The problem of this was, even though it was accurate with the slopes, it didn't show the ski resort. I and mean, we didn't show the slopes accurately or as, uh, depict them as well as we wanted. So we took the liberty of accentuating the ups and downs and came up with this. So the dips are about twice what it should be. We added the ski trails and that became a model of the pop-up for a mountain. When I met Ib in the mid eighties and I had a great idea to do pop-up books, Ib said, there's not a lot of money in books, it's in advertising. And I said that the, the advertising with pop-ups is too expensive and they're the best thing to do. Uh, he said he had ideas how to do them inexpensively. And with that, it opened up a great business relationship that we had more than a business relationship a great friendship and we the first project we worked on together for Leah Burnett involved the process of a changing image with a race car to a one-of-a-kind Corvette which they gave away and this was the sweepstakes. So the entire spread consisting of this section was put into the magazine. And in order to do that, and when it is, I want to show you a picture of Ib at the plant where we did all the assembly for this ad. Staying there, he ran the thing. And this is what it would do to map out, if you can zoom in there, to map out all those tables with all the people at those tables assembling all the pop-ups or movables that are needed for this ad. And we had to do about 6 million in 12 weeks. And this would be the steps. And if you see at the bottom, it would say how many seconds it would take to do this. And when you're doing five million of something, each second is worth a lot. And the, the key for this was to keep the number of blue points and number of folds down to a minimum. One other main character, it's not all about Ib, but it's about this other gentleman I mentioned before, John Stregen. We call him Silverblade because he had the wonderful, wonderful way of using an X-Acto knife and cutting out everything. And the gentleman next to him is one of the most, and uh, John Stregen passed away in about 2003. But the person next to him is David Carter. And this picture was taken in Bologna at the, at the Bologna Children's Book Fair. And David Carter, I think, is the leading paper engineer today. And David is responsible for probably one of the best series of pop-up books for children. It's called the Bugs in a Box. And a 
And I show David's work because this is the book. If someone is interested in paper engineering and the history and the pop-ups, this is the book to use. There are other people, other books on how to make pop-ups, but you can see David and his co-author, Jim Diaz, really explored every angle and in doing so, and also the movable, the wheels that turn and the different elements. And they would show the back of it so you could do your own create your own pop-up. Jim Diaz and uh, David Carter just revised this book. And I mentioned this one because I think this is one of the best pop-ups done. David did a series of five of these books. And I mentioned David uh, as a, he was a protege or student of the leading paper engineers at the beginning. Uh, I'll tell you one little anecdote, and that is Ib Pennick was in, intuitive on how to do something. If Ib wanted to, if John Stregen wanted to do a a pop-up of a ship. What John would do would be to mathematically compute the center of the ship, compute where the uh, the best angle of the bow would be, where the folds would be, all by using math. Ib, on the other hand, would build the ship, put it inside a book, Close the book up around the ship, open it up and said, well, that's where the folds should be. Wanted to bring out one more thing. We were, I was called in by Lee Burnett one time to do a special pop-up for an ad. We did 7 million of these. And what Benson the Hedges, who Philip Morris did, was create a cigarette pack that had rounded corners. And the ad agency wanted to really advertise the rounded smooth corners and that if you had it in your pocket, it would not create a, a straight edge. And they said, can you create a pop-up that would pop up a cigarette pack with rounded corners? And this is what we did. And we took the cigarette pack exactly. This went through 17 different versions before we finally got the right one. Um, and finally, a great presentation the other day by um, Mark Setter Ducati. And I wanted to show this, how ideas come from long ago. This was the, Mark showed this, the what they call the eccentric circle, where if you moved the circle around, the colored dots would change top and bottom. And Mark and I had the great idea of doing that with a, you see, there we go. Red, and as you move it, blue, and keep going around. So this, we took the paper engineering and extrapolated to the three dimensions or plastic. And uh, Scott, if you want to uh, host any uh, questions, they'll probably help me in the next 15, 20 minutes to address the questions. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll go through the questions and read, read the ones that I find in the, in the, in the chat. And um, somebody, if I, if I get, if I miss anything, please put it in the Q&A and that I'll see certainly. So um, where can we learn how to make our own movable pop-up books? I think this one's already been answered right. uh, by you and Dick also shared the, the mention of uh, David Carter's book, James Diaz and David Carter. I think that's the best one. There are others, Paul Jackson, there are other, there are pop-up books on how to make pop-up books. And then of course on the web, uh, but I would certainly uh, get David Carter's book. 
of the art of pop-up. Wonder how many of those nowadays one can do at home or hacker maker pieces, maker places with 3D printers, laser cutters, etc. Uh, that's a good question, and I would think that's more on the ver on the on the realm of what they call artist books, where an artist or um, can create a very limited edition of ten or twenty or thirty, usually numbered. Um, wonderful creations uh, using the world of self-made paper, specialized binding, specialized fonts, specialized printing. But the, what, the challenge, the, the thing that fascinated me was how you could do 30 or 40 or 50,000 or hundreds of thousands of books economically. Um, Wally discovered, uh, interestingly, that the best way to do that is called a cooperative or uh, of sales. So at the typically at the uh, at the international book fairs, Bologna was a children's book fair, uh, U.S. at the book expo or in uh, Frankfurt at the big book fair, they would present the producers would present their ideas and pop ups, and usually the American or English language edition would take uh, the bulk of it. Let's say we'll take 30,000 copies and then they would show up to the French and the French might take, we'll take 10,000 copies. The Germans could take 10,000. Um, you know, maybe some other countries like in uh, Scandinavia might take 3,000 copies. So when you added all the numbers together, instead of doing just an English language edition of 30,000, you would do an international edition of let's say double that, 60,000 and get the cost down. And what the, the elements of the pop-up were all the same, all the die cutting was the same, all the gluing, only the words were different. So when they printed the pop-ups, they would print all the, the different colors and they would change the black plates after they did the first run of English language and put another language in. And what interesting to me was when you had something like an alphabet book in English, if it was in a different language, how could you do that? How could you do another A or another B? One of the best, wonderful pop-ups was uh, David Pelham. And here he had A for animals, B for baboon, and so on, 26 pop-ups. And then what happens when you get a foreign language? It's the same A for animals, but the words translate at the bottom. Um, so to use 3D printing or use specialized printing, you come up with maybe a handful of pop-ups or one in particular, but you couldn't do 30 or 40,000. Okay. Uh, next question. Have you seen magic flip books, coloring books? These are my fave. Yes. I would call those a part of the eccentric books category. Uh, I love flip books and... Uh, and how they change, and we could bring those out, but that's a whole other hour. Uh, this is more of a comment, but you might want to comment as well. So it seems like paper engineering was a legitimate profession. It still is. And some of the best individuals are producing, in the early, in the mid-60s, there was probably eight to ten people that were doing it. Um, you had a, a group in England, uh, the best one is Ron Vandermeer, another, even though he's uh, Dutch, he lives in London. And, um, and Ron really changed the world of pop-ups and what was considered doable when he did the art pack, which is a cocktail table size book for $50 and for adults. And what Ron did And it's still one of the, the best books. On the history of art. Now this is supposed to be Picasso. It doesn't look like Picasso because it's too curvy, I think. And I asked Ron about this. And Ron said, here was the problem he had. In this book, there were a lot of rights 
that had to be negotiated for the use of these images. And the Picasso Foundation, the Picasso, the rights to Picasso were not available. So Ron had to sit down, he said, around a table of legal representatives. And he showed the image that he wanted to use in the book. And they said, you can't do that. That's too much like Picasso. So Ron brought out his scissors and trimmed. And they said, can I do that? And they said, no, it still looks too much like Picasso. So he trimmed it a little bit more. And can I do that? And they said, yep, you can do that. <laughs> and by the way, that's a, a thing about what I like about the, the books and visiting with the paper engineers. In my opinion, every pop-up book has a story. In every book, there is a reason why paper engineers did something or an illustrator did something or even an author did something. And because of the process of producing books, there are all these little stories that no one knows about. And um, a great example would be David Carter when he did one book. So here's David Carter on Bugs in Space. And it turns out, he told me about this, he wrote it down here. The spaceship is, is shooting off near his hometown of Ogden, Utah. And then he tells me that the reason, and you don't see it, maybe you, you do see it, there's some letters on the spaceship and those are the initials of his two daughters. So when I would have uh, visit with paper engineers and the producers, I would, that's the stories I wanted to try to glean from all these people that worked on these books. Tell me about the inside. Tell me why you did this or why you did that. Um, Nancy makes a comment. There's a new book to add to your collection, Molly and the Mathematical Mystery by Eugenia Chang. I bought, I would, you know what, I'm going to get that next. Thanks, Nancy. All right, uh, Dick Esterly, is there an Alice in Wonderland? There are dozens of Alice in Wonderland books actually going back. Um, and John Strigian is one of my favorites. And this is the one. You can see going through the rabbit hole and getting smaller. And I'm going to jump ahead here. Oh, here's the Cheshire cat disappearing with a smile. But I love, oh, and here's a great, a great example of when he, the, when the um, flamingo kicks the ball and it moves the ball forward. But I love this spread here. There are probably a good six or eight, maybe ten, movable books with Alice as a theme. But because Martin Gardner's interest in Alice, this is one of the best books. Paul says, what is the state of computer tools to design and cut the books? Ooh, that's a good question, too. Ib never did use uh, computers. It was almost like an architect on a drafting table. But his, I would, I would, his colleague is Tor Logvig, another Scandinavian name. Tor is still alive, still doing work, and uh, lives in Northern California. And Tor really does use the computer to... Uh, with the computer with the mapping out the lines and so forth uh, to get things streamlined. So the computer in graphic design today really does play a role with paper engineering. Um, Dick again asks, who was the band on the CD? Uh, nothing important. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't anything like uh, what I wanted to do and which I'll bring someone like Frank Zappa when we did this pop-up, um, the problem was Zappa had bootleg editions of his recordings. And so the studio wanted to do 
a beat the boots and have it in a, what looked like a boot, a boot box. And so here was the thing we created. With the pop up. And I don't know if you can see, but here is the, let me get this here. Can you see the image here? Mm -hmm. There's the bootleg artist. Maybe get in closer. Can you see this? Yes. And it's Rhino Records. So over here is the Rhino <laughs> cutting the microphone of the bootleg. And underneath this is uh, some cassettes and a t-shirt. So some surprises inside this. Now this one I was very proud of. And the one, the other thing in the music world I was most proud of would have been this one here. And this is one where the recording studio found some uh, rediscovered, uh, some old 45s of Stairway to Heaven or CDs of Stairway to Heaven. And they wanted to make a presentation of this. And so we created this for them. So in one side was the discovered old record and the other side was the DVD, another limited edition of Stairway to Heaven. These are the uh, music items I was most proud of. Okay, Paul says, um, not a question, an interesting anecdote. Edward Tufte notes that a 1570 edition of Euclid's geometry, as you pointed out, um, demonstrated solid geometry. In tribute, he reprinted an identical pop-up over 400 years later in Envisioning Information. He describes the difficulty his publisher had with the glue wrinkling after a while. He brought out the 1570 Euclid and pointed out it hadn't wrinkled yet. <laughs> and that's another, all those parts about what glue is the best glue for these, for the paper. And the paper weight for books is a little bit heavier than the paper weight for the magazines, uh, the pop-ups. And so the magazine pop-ups with the little, with thinner paper, we were very critical of the, which glue we could use and the water content in the glue. And so we had special glue ordered by the glue manufacturer. And because the jobs were so big, uh, we didn't order tubes of glue. We ordered uh, barrels of glue. Okay, but it's the water, it's the water content that we had to be uh, uh, cognizant of. Uh, Carlos Acan asks, are there any pop-up books, books that use string art? String art? String art, sorry. Oh, string art, yes. Ib always called those doodads using a string in uh, uh, here. And here's one, uh, Allie's Comet. And in the end, um, no, wait a minute, excuse me. I need space shuttle, that's the one, I knew it's space. So you had the space shuttle and you counted down one and then it shot off. But in the last spread here, here. Can you see this? Yeah. Now, there is string here. And when you move it, is that, see how the scene moves? Mm -hmm. Because of the screen. And I brought out the other one, Halley's uh, Comet, real quick, because this came out during the Halley's Comet. But here's what I really love about this. You see the pop-up telescope? This is great. Here's a series of four slides showing the image of Halley's Comet as it's getting closer. And when you look through the lens, you can see images of Halley's Comet as if you were looking through a telescope. And it closes up. Would be interesting to hear if or how this world influenced the world of paper toy engineering. It seems to be a field with growing interest recently. There's a gentleman by the name of Blair Whitten who wrote a book that's over there called Paper Toys of the World. And uh, that it would be the treatise to look at for that subject. Oh, we had another question about a book title. Um, what is the Eccentrics book called, please? 
Well, the eccentric could be any books, including whole books and, and um, things with sound and all that. Um, I think uh, the Dewey Decimal System calls them move, toy and movable books, toy books. Uh, but I like uh, Dave Walker at Yale University calling everything eccentric books that was not your usual. I would urge people, if they wanted to really get great pop-ups, to go and see the um, National Geographic series. And here was another reason, the National Geographic series had a lot more money to spend on these pop-ups. And the gentleman that wrote the, uh, the treatise on uh, the pop-up elements with David Carter, Jim Diaz, and John Streeson were the people who are responsible for this series of books. And so here's one, the mom. And here's a quick change here on the snow monkeys, Japanese snow monkeys. <laughs> and uh, if you want to point up over here, these would be the National Geographic series of books. And those are wonderful because National Geographic uh, did these directly. And they could, instead of selling uh, 30 to 40 or 50,000 books, their print runs were closer to 250,000. And the reason was they had a huge mailing list or membership list. I think consisting of about 10 million members. When they sent out a, um, a, you know, their, their uh, what's for sale, it went to a lot of individuals and it was very cost effective. I love these books and the paper engineering behind them. Uh, Suyash Joshi, Joshi asked, do people buy these because of the story it has or for the fun of playing and seeing pop-ups? I think people buy them because, you know, if they're buying children's, you know, kids' books, say it's for the story. But if they learn the behind the scenes or is interested in what goes on behind the scenes, uh, the story is wonderful. I will encourage people on the One Red Dot series of David Carter. There's, like I said, there's five of these. And um, David, when he uh, had a creation, a pop-up creation. They didn't go in any other book, and he didn't know what to do with it. He threw it away, threw it away, and put it in a file cabinet. And after years and years, he pulled out uh, all these things that couldn't go anywhere, and decided to um, see how he could use them in a pop-up. And like I said, five books, five colors, and he was inspired by a Chagall exhibit with the uh, colors of Chagall and use those with red, yellow, black, white, and blue, and created a series, what I call architecturally wonderful books. In the last few years, the last 10 years, there's been great advancements in paper engineering and the ability to do books that are much more elaborate than they had in the past. They didn't have the constraints of the cost uh, that Ib was working under, which literally was like $5,000 in paper engineering. And today they have $100,000 they can throw in a paper engineering. Uh, George Hart asks, is there a book or other reference with the history you have explained? There's quite a few out there. I think if you Google pop-up history, you know, you would get it. I, um, here's the source. I would go to the movable, I would look up the movable book society if you can believe there is one. And the Move of the Book Society would have all the resources for the history and connection with people involved in pop-ups. And one of the leading collectors is a woman by the name of Ellen Rubin. You can go on her website called Pop-Up Lady, and you can get a lot of information about pop-ups through Ellen's site. And I think one last question from Dick. Uh, are you planning a pop-up of non-Euclidean geometry? <laughs> Hyperbolic curves or something? What? <laughs> All right. So um, I there don't... is a pop-up. Uh, you talk about crazy things. The hadron, uh, the, the collider at CERN. There's pop-ups of 
You know, I have one over here for adults only. <laughs> so there's a pop-up Kama Sutra. Um, it's, uh, I think any subject that's ever been done has been done, but non-Euclidean geometry would be a challenge. All right, I think we should we should wrap it up. Um, this has been this has been marvelous, John. Thank you very much. Uh, we got great engagement from everyone. It's unfortunate we only have an hour. <laughs> so thanks so much, John. This has been a delight.